Thank you for joining us for today's COVID-19 Mental Health Forum. My name is Christina Cordy and I'm filling in for Kirsten Conan today. Today's forum will discuss COVID-19 and brain health, enhancing the resilience to stress ratio. Today we'll hear from Dr. Greg Frischone, who will discuss this topic followed by audience questions. Please direct your questions to the Q&A box during the presentation. Dr. Frischone is the mind-body medicine professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and director of the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. He also serves as associate chief of psychiatry, director of the Chester Pierce Division of Global Psychiatry, co-director of the McCann Center for Brain Health, and senior medical advisor for the MGH Red Sox Foundation home base program for service members, veterans, and their families at MGH. He is the author of over 185 articles and of several books, including Compassion and Healing in Medicine and Society, On the Nature and Uses of Attachment Solutions to Separation Challenges, and The, Stre the Science of Stress. In, doctor, uh, in 2017, Dr. Frischone was honored with the, the Thomas and Eleanor Hackett Career Award of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. And with that, I'll turn the forum over to Dr. Frischone. Thank you, Christina, for that uh, uh, very generous introduction. It's, uh, it's very nice to be with everyone today. I appreciate being asked to talk about this topic. I think COVID-19 is on everyone's mind and it's, it's nice to be able to give um, a perspective on why stress and resilience is so important for general health. I have no conflict of interest to disclose for this talk. Now, uh, I wanted to make mention of this wonderful chapter, some of you may know, uh, by Morgenstein and colleagues. It came out in 2017, um, a full two, almost three years before the present pandemic. And um, um, Dr. Morgenstein and his colleagues really nailed it. Um, they pointed out uh, that pandemics have a global reach uh, and are massively destructive. And historically, they've been more devastating than any other type of disaster. So when you think about it, in our country, right, it's uh, more than three times as many deaths as we um, uh, experienced in the Vietnam War. Um, it's about what we experienced in World War I. Um, so it's, it's a really big deal and all of us are, are feeling the effects of, of um, um, COVID-19 fear. And of course, this comes on the heels of a decade full of other pandemics, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, H1N1 swine flu, MERS, Ebola, Zika, and all of these viral pandemics have uh, had uh, um, a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with them. They really are significant threats to our global health security. And they have mental health consequences, which really take a toll on general health of uh, communities and indeed nations. So everyone I think is rightfully very nervous. Uh, it's a mysterious uh, and, and wily microbe uh, that causes an awful lot of suffering. Um, recently, the American Psychological Association in their annual Stress in America surveys show that 60 to 70 percent of us are worried about contracting COVID-19. So we share that, that apprehension. Um, and it really is important for us to spend some time uh, um, focusing on how are we going to restore and preserve brain health in the context of this assault. Um, because wellness and resilience uh, really are so important for clinical medicine, I'm a clinician, but also for public health. It's really where clinical medicine and public health join together. It's, it's really important for the health of our communities. So I wanna um, offer up this, this perspective or this structure for today's talk. Brain health exists on a continuum. On one end, there's brain health, and I'll uh, make an attempt at describing what we mean by brain health. On the other end, there's brain failure. 
And brains fail just like our lungs do and our kidneys do and our hearts do. Uh, and um, the reason why I wanna spend a few moments looking at brain failure is because part of our job as clinicians and as public health specialists is not only to do primary prevention and secondary prevention, but to do tertiary prevention, to try to reduce the mental health and the brain failure consequences in, in folks who have suffered COVID-19 infection. So what are we talking about when we mention that side of the continuum, the brain failure side? Well, let's, uh, let's take an excursion way back into how the brain evolved, why it evolved. A normal brain is designed to sense its environment, to analyze the information that's coming in and to affect a motor response. And when you think about it evolutionarily, those four operations really designate whether something is alive or not. Every living thing senses its environment, has some level of analysis and affects uh, motor response. And evolution has bequeathed us this amazing organism, probably the most complex, biological or organ that has ever evolved, the brain, to do these four operations of life. And the brain is healthy when it makes decisions that help it help the, the, the individual organism survive and thrive. And, and what does that mean physiologically? The healthy brain is healthy when it maintains its physio physiology within a normative range. It's not a standard deviation or two standard deviations beyond the mean in terms of maintaining blood pressure and heart rate and its thyroid axis, its gonadotropic axis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the brain is healthy when it can form its attachments to food, sexual objects, social objects, future objects, and do it without an, an excess loss of energy. Um, so the brain fails when there are neuromedical or neuropsychiatric insults that force the brain to lose energy in maintaining its attachments. Okay, let's see here. So let's think about COVID-19 in the brain. Um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes delirium altered consciousness, which leads to agitation. It can lead to symptoms of depression and anxiety and insomnia. This is not surprising to us as clinicians because of the severity of the illness in certain patients. And they suffer from complications because they're older. They have substrates at risk because of underlying vulnerabilities. We call these vulnerabilities usually these non communicable diseases, and we'll get into that in a moment. Just think about what we've learned about the, the scores of, of patients who've experienced extreme intensive care unit uh, um, um, uh, delirium from being on ventilators, not for a couple of days, but for weeks on end. Um, Khan et al. recently reported that 74% of ICU delirium for a week or more um, um, when you're dealing with severe COVID-19. That's a lot of delirium. And so some authors have called the COVID-19 ICU the delirium factory. That's brain failure. But we also see some specific symptoms. You've read about loss of smell and taste, anosmia, ejusia, the headaches, um, uh, um, important symptom stroke, seizure, lack of motivation, and even some movement disorders. Uh, so there are a lot of different types of brain failure. And one of the things that's important for us when we're thinking of tertiary prevention is that there, there's a long history of viral causes of encephalitis, herpes virus encephalitis, um, varicella virus, enterovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, adenovirus, they can all cause encephalitis. And there are post-viral encephalitides that really cause a reduction 
in um, um, cognition, affect, behavior, and quality of life. There's a, an old um, um, diagnosis called encephalitis lethargica. We still don't know exactly what the virus was that caused it, but for decades, into the late 30s, uh, there were patients who in, the, in 1915 through 1918 had a encephalitis and they never got over it. They were left with a chronic encephalopathy. So this is something that worries us, neuropsychiatrists and neurologists with COVID-19. And so only time will tell what kind of post-viral syndromes we're gonna face. And again, this is very important for us in clinical medicine and public health if we want to do um, tertiary prevention. Not only that, but you've read about mental health pandemic in response to COVID-19. And we have to be highly alert to the potential high rates of common mental disorders, stress-related disorders that are in the process of emerging and may um, uh, increase in prevalence as time goes on. Uh, so think about isolation and loneliness. John Gacciopo and, and the, the, the correlation of loneliness with downstream medical and psychiatric illness. Um, food and shelter insecurity, unemployment, a reduction in socioeconomic status, all of these things we know as social determinants of health can really um, be a drag on people's health longitudinally. Then think about um, um, our uh, um, um, fellow community members who are struggling with severe mental illness. How are they going to uh, manage the stress of COVID-19? So we have to be on guard for um, an increased um, incidence of psychotic decompensations. Symptoms of grief. We've seen patients um, in the hospital that they're, they've been been extubated after being intubated and invented in the ICU, and they're worried about their spouse who's in another ICU in another hospital um, um, somewhere. So there are a lot of grief responses. Um, separation and loss, um, uh, the worry about um, uh, suicide risk um, from all of these stressors, anxiety, depression, PTSD, insomnia. Um, these are the big time problems that we may wind up facing. Um, I should also mention that we're not only talking about patients, we're talking about family members who are really fried with anxiety over COVID-19 when one of their loved ones has had an experience with it. Um, and caregivers, of course, you, you, you're becoming more familiar with burnout moral injury, compassion fatigue, secondary PTSD in frontline clinicians. This has been a big topic um, um, in the media, but also in academic centers and in community hospitals. Um, uh, our frontline clinicians have done um, an amazing job uh, managing um, this pandemic, uh, but we worry about the toll it may be taking. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that certain segments of our population have really borne the brunt of this COVID-19. Um, and, and you've heard it said that, that while we started out this pandemic saying that the virus is the great equalizer, unfortunately, it, it, there are, there are um, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disparities that, that um, sort of make us think, well, it's not an equalizer. There are people who are suffering to a greater extent. Now, we know that there are almost 100 million uh, Americans, uh, adults, who are at higher risk from COVID-19. So they would be in the secondary prevention category, right? And, and in that category, of course, um, um, a lot of, of people who are in what we're starting to call the BIPOC population, Black, um, Indigenous peoples, people of color, they appear to be, and, and there's very good data uh, um, to support this, at um, increased risk for developing COVID-19 and severe forms of COVID-19. That means their morbidity and mortality is, is occurring at an excess rate in, in um, 
this segment of our population. And people think that there are structural reasons, social reasons, structural racism, socioeconomic status um, uh, disparities that are setting up the, these, these people at increased risk. But when you think about it in terms of, of um, um, physiology, um, a lot of this excess risk may be um, related to metabolic syndrome. Uh, uh, so we know that the rate of diabetes, for example, is 66% higher in, in blacks, hypertension 49% higher. So metabolic syndrome is stress related and stigmata includes tronchal obesity and hypertension and hyperlipidemia and um, a relative insensitivity of insulin receptors to insulin causing type 2 diabetes. So that's really important. Stress is a driver of this excess risk because it creates um, a higher um, um, incidence of uh, metabolic syndrome in these, these um, um, uh, populations that suffer disparities in our society. We also think in Bizu Galei uh, of our, our department and our Division of Global Psychiatry, but also at the Harvard School of Public Health, he and I and colleagues have just submitted an article. Um, the UCLA group, Stephen Cole and Michael Irwin and, and um, George Slavich and others, have really put on the map the fact that when you look at transcriptomic analysis of white blood cells, you see a very interesting pattern in people who are exposed to chronic stress. They have a burgeoning of, of um, um, antibacterial, if you will, NF-kappa B transcription factor immune response, kind of thing we see in COVID-19, the cytokine storm, pro-inflammatory cytokine storm, that really causes a lot of the pathology and downstream morbidity and mortality. But also when you have chronic stress, you have a relative dampening of, of um, what's called type one interferon antiviral immune response. So it could be that in certain populations who are victims of racism and disparity, they could have uh, they could be setups for a heightened cytokine storm and a reduced antiviral response. And that would uh, um, be a double hit, if you will. So what is stress? Stress really is what the brain does to itself and the rest of the body when it faces a separation challenge. Why do I say that? Our first anxiety, our first challenge when we're, we're an infant is individual uh, psychological identity. Uh, and, that's, and that's called separation individuation in the literature. That separation anxiety never goes away. Uh, we fortunately, our brains develop enough to tolerate that separation stress uh, through the auspices of something called object constancy. We know our mothers exist for us even when they're not in the room and we can't hear them. So that's an attachment solution that becomes available to us. But separation anxiety never goes away. And the three conduits from brain to body includes the sympathetic nervous system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis pouring out the stress hormone cortisol, and the inflammatory response, the innate immune response with the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So when you feel threatened with separation, you're gonna have an outpouring in those three systems. We also know that, that eight out of the nine uh, uh, normal stressors as taught to us by the psychologist Holmes and Ray many years ago are separation stressors in the normal adult population. And stress comes in three varieties, normal, tolerable, and toxic. And, it, and as you'll see, it really is a bell curve. And the normal stress that we feel every morning when we wake up helps us to actually function more efficiently and effectively. And we can even bump it up if we know we have a full panel of patients uh, and there are many um, sick patients on our panel, that may be tolerable stress and we can actually function more efficiently and effectively. But too much of that, and we're gonna go over the top into toxic stress. And that's where those physiological gene expression uh, um, um, uh, 
uh, vulnerabilities may emerge. Now, separation, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but the guy in the upper left is a, a mentor of mine, now passed away, probably one of the, of the top ne comparative neuroanatomists of the 20th century, and he got it. You see here that the most painful mammalian condition is separation. Uh, and there are evolutionary reasons for this. This is the great English psychiatrist and father of attachment theory, John Bowlby. And as he said, man's environment of evolutionary adaptiveness is always gonna be secure base attachment. And all of you out there, I feel safe in saying are mammals. So you're never gonna be able to escape the pain of separation, the stress of separation. And that pain in, of separation is going to um, uh, emerge in environmental stressors, major life events, trauma, abuse. There are gonna be individual susceptibilities. We'll talk more about that. There'll be epigenetic changes in, in structure and function of the brain. It's gonna emerge as perceived stress, and that's gonna lead to hypervigilance perhaps, behavioral responses, fight, flight, freeze, um, use of maladaptive uh, um, lifestyle behaviors, physiological responses, all of that's gonna come out in something we call allostasis, which really is maintaining stability in the face of stress. And when it's too, when you're too overloaded and your brain has a problem maintaining physiological stability in the face of change, that's something we call allostatic loading. And that definitely can lead to, to um, 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 disease vulnerability. Very quickly, these areas of the brain, the dorsal anterior cingulate, we now call it the mid cingulate, and the medial prefrontal cortex, which includes the anterior cingulate and the medial orbifrontal cortex, they have evolved to be able to speak to the amygdala, our fear conditioning center that sets those three stress response systems, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the sympathetic nervous system, the inflammatory response, in motion. And when we burnish, when we strengthen these areas, we have better control, emotional control of the, the amygdala. We can deal with fear, anxiety, worry, hypervigilance, avoidance, and emotional dysregulation more effectively. That's where resilience comes from. I mentioned the bell-shaped curve. You see what we want to do through resilience training and stress reduction is move our, our bell curve. This would be a normal stress, tolerable stress, toxic stress. We want to move it to the right so we can tolerate more arousal and stress and continue to perform and feel healthy. We know from Bruce McEwen and his group that there are structural and functional determinants of the psychology and behavior that emerges. And so synapses, neurogenesis, dendritic um, behavior, when we have tolerable stress here, normal stress, tolerable stress, they actually improve in efficiency and effectiveness and in structure and function. But too much chronic toxic stress, and there, there's damage structurally and functionally in the brain. That's really, really important to realize. And believe it or not, every cell in your body has mitochondria they too are analyzing your stress. We used to think there was a linear response to, uh, you know, in terms of stress causing mitochondrial dysfunction. We now that know that mitochondria, like the brain, like your psychology, actually improves with normal stress, tolerable stress, but too much and mitochondrial uh, behavior uh, suffers. I'm gonna move ahead quickly. So COVID-19, there are certain specific pandemic fears. People staying at home, they're dying at home, uh, enduring surges of COVID-19. The fear of lack of uh, personal protective equipment. The fear of not having enough ventilators and changing ventilator strategies in ICUs. The, the fear of rationing um, and, and the ethical problems that causes. The fear that we would not be able to decompress crowded hospitals building of field hospitals, and then the fear amongst those portions of our society that are at higher risk to COVID, um, and also the, the, our fear of the mental health pandemic I talked about earlier. Now, this slide is really important. 
Um, there's a three-hit concept of vulnerability and resilience. We all are born with genetic endowments and predispositions or vulnerabilities. A lot of it has to do with the, 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 our in, uh, genetics in terms of our receptor physiology. We also have um, our early um, environmental experiences. They go together to create a certain phenotype. And then when there's a later life challenge, like a COVID-19 pandemic, we may wind up in the vulnerable category or in the resilient category. This is the work of the Kluet and his colleagues. Now, getting into resilience, this is the work of Steve Southwick, a friend of ours at the Benson Henry Institute, and Dennis Charney, who's the CEO at Mount Sinai in New York. We can think about 10 themes in resilient human, uh, human beings. They have resilient role models. They have positive emotions. They're optimists. They are better at emotional regulation, which we talked about. They have active rather than passive coping. They benefit from good social support. They employ cognitive flexibility so they can meet the demands of changing environments. They have spiritual connectedness. They're connected to something greater than themselves. They follow a moral code that often involves pro-social behavior and altruism. There's meaning and purpose in their lives as a result. And they are, have training in managing challenges that are physical, psychological, and spiritual. So when you build resilience, you strengthen those parts of the brain I showed you earlier, you're able to dampen the amygdala-driven stress response. So at the Benson Henry Institute in the middle 2000s, um, learning from the experience of wounded warriors in the Middle East wars, we put together a program called the SMART program, the Stress Management Resilience Training Program. It, and we build it, built it off of an equation we call the mind-body medicine equation, which is really a, a ratio of resilience to stress. And stress can be thought of as separation threats. Think about our, our um, uh, people in, who are patients, but also people in our community who've suffered adverse childhood experiences. That greatly increases the numerator here. So we have a job to do. We have to teach people many different ways to reduce stress. That comes in the form of relaxation response, meditative approaches, mindful exercise, mindfulness. We can teach those skills. But social support is a sine qua non of human resilience for those evolutionary reasons I mentioned. Then cognitive skills. Some of us are negative thinkers. We want to build a, um, um, that kind of antidote to pessimistic thinking. There are many reasons why we experience these challenges or negative ex uh, things in our lives. And we want to have a, a, a realistic view of what's going on, not just think negatively about ourselves. Positive psychology, meaning, purpose, gratefulness, forgiveness, uh, spiritual connectedness, exercise, mindful exercise, nutrition, um, a, a low glycemic diet, sleep hygiene, healthy habits um, are all important in building human resilience. So in our program, we teach relaxation response, mindfulness, um, um, we deal with separation stress through social connection, pro-social behavior, cognitive skills, positive psychology, acceptance and commitment to moral values, belief in conscious positive expectation, and um, uh, spiritual connection, and then staying resilient through healthy behaviors, and building a sense of humor about life too is really important. So we want to improve that resilience to stress ratio, giving people a better chance of avoiding vulnerabilities. This becomes really important in COVID-19 because I hope you saw that, that we're building a, a research base, um, an evidence base to support this idea. It's still a hypothesis, but to support this idea that stress, especially this conserved transcriptional response to adversity is the UCLA group calls it, may set up uh, people at high chronic stress uh, to be um, more at risk for morbidity and mortality from COVID. This is important for patients, families, and caregivers, as I mentioned. We have to scale up approaches to improve access to stress reduction and resiliency enhancement uh, through telehealth, maybe physiological mar uh, monitoring smartphone apps. 
Tate Shanafelt is an expert in um, um, uh, physician burnout. Um, he's uh, now at Stanford, used to be at the Mayo Clinic. And he, he wrote a provocative article uh, um, amidst the COVID-19 crisis. And he said, frontline clinicians are looking to be heard. Um, they are looking to be protected. Um, they're looking to be prepared, training. Um, they're looking to be supported. Uh, so they want their limitations acknowledged in terms of extreme work hours and uncertainty, intense exposure. And they want to be cared for. They want holistic support for themselves and their families while they are behaving altruistically, helping others. So what we did, we, we um, created, we adapted our SMART program for the Mass General Frontline Clinicians. And this is a preliminary study with an N of, of 101 of our adapted SMART program for COVID-19 frontline clinicians. And you see there's some signal in the noise perhaps, and we're um, 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 looking for support to, to um, do a, a more um, um, uh, longitudinal perspective study on frontline clinicians but significant results in depression, generalized anxiety, loneliness, isolation, mindfulness, acceptance, um, and resilience and coping. So, you know, our job is, as I said at the beginning, to really work hard at providing structure and, and um, um, initiatives, programs to do Tertiary prevention with those who have suffered with COVID-19, because they do face, at least in, in, in some proportion, uh, a, a, a long rehabilitation to get back to baseline. Uh, but also secondary prevention. Think about those, those um, minority population who are at increased risk, uh, the stress-related um, uh, risk, the elderly, et cetera, secondary prevention, um, is going to be really, really important in the weeks and months ahead. And then primary prevention, because all of us are in this together. We all know about COVID-19. We are all suffering separation stress. Think about what we used to call social distancing. We now call physical distancing. This is one of the ironies of dealing with this pandemic, because we, we have a reduction in that normal uh, resilient factor of social support that I mentioned. Um, uh, so we, this is our job. We have to avoid burnout, which is signified by emotional exhaustion, which comes from the culture of endurance in frontline clinicians, for example, poor personal sense of accomplishment, depersonalization, objectifying people around us. These three ingredients are not only true of frontline clinicians, it's true of everyone in every job or family situation. And that's, this is coming from chronic toxic stress. And that's why we need this effort at primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. How do we do it? First of all, I think we need to prioritize self-care. Why? This is not a, a narcissistic exercise. We want to cultivate the core features of stress management, resilience um, um, training in order to help people, yes, to survive and thrive so that they can contribute to the community. We wanna maintain commitment to your values. We wanna enhance attention to eulogy values as opposed to resume values. Um, this is really um, what's most important in our heart and souls um, so that we can avoid the, the stress and strain of moral injury when we're going against the things we value most, our connectedness, our, our spirituality, um, that kind of thing. We wanna reduce our job pressures as, as, as possible. We have to realize we can't do it alone, so we need to set reasonable li limits on expectations, and we have to rely on collective capacity more. We have to seek out, maintain our attachments for those reasons that I mentioned at the beginning. This is perhaps the most important component when we understand how our brains evolved um, and remembering Bowlby's words, our environment of evolutionary adaptiveness of resilience is gonna be secure base attachment. I put up a, 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 um, a website here. 
our department, Jordan, Jordan Smaller um, and uh, Carmel Choi have curated this wonderful website with many, many different approaches to stress management and resilience training, among which is our um, Benson Henry Institute. Now I wanna um, um, mention two favorite quotes of mine. Um, um, this is from Edith Wharton, one of America's greatest writers from her backward glance. And Wharton wrote, in spite of illness, in spite even of the arch enemy's sorrow, one can remain alive long past the usual date of disintegration if one is unafraid of change, insatiable in intellectual curiosity, interested in big things, and happy in small ways. I think you see in here uh, um, reflections of our topic today. We all fear disintegration, separation, and Wharton is telling us there are inner strengths that we can access to help us get through. And then I want to mention um, um, the words of Reinhold Niebuhr, um, the great 20th century American theologian, um, a very pragmatic theologian. And in his book titled The Irony of American History, which is an ironic title for the times we're going through in America, he, he wrote, nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. So, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, I think a very important quote for us at this particular moment in the context of our history in America, as we're facing um, COVID-19 pandemic. And I think uh, Niebuhr has some words of wisdom for us here. Um, we have to keep the faith uh, and the faith really here is in the goodwill of um, members of our communities um, and also in those uh, uh, medical scientists really working night and day to try to find um, therapies and vaccines for this uh, um, uh, virus. Uh, I'm of the, the clinical vintage where when I finished my training in, in um, 1983, um, uh, my first jobs uh, um, were on a HIV ward. And um, it was a very sorrowful job for us clinicians because uh, patients invariably died. We followed them for weeks um, as they um, dilapidated from uh, this very uh, neurotropic virus uh, as the virus destroyed their brains. And so I can, I have some evidence for keeping faith because um, um, I, um, I feel very um, um, joyful when I think about how our um, colleagues in, in medical science um, found a way um, to deal with uh, that scourge, the scourge of HIV. And I have confidence and faith that we'll do the same with uh, um, SARS COVID too. So with that, I'll end and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Greg. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the questions. And so we have a couple of questions that have come in um, from the audience attendees, but I actually wanted to start off with a question that came from um, Bazoo within our own global psychiatry group. And so he writes, as you know, burnout is a significant public health concern among um, healthcare providers, particularly for those in low and middle income countries, such as Sub-Saharan Africa. What suggestions do you have to address burnout in low income settings? Yes. Well, Mbazu, who is a very good friend of mine, wrote a wonderful article um, with our colleagues on this very point because it was, it was under-recognized. Um, um, there's a lot that's been written about burnout in um, uh, high resource countries in, in, in the West and so on. Uh, but those of us who've been exposed to the heroic clinicians in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, um, when we 
take a moment and think about the challenges that we, they face. We just shake our heads. And, um, um, uh, you know, I'm reminded in, in Bizu's home country of Ethiopia, when they finish medical school, they have to go work in a village and um, <laughs> um, doing general medicine. And uh, I remember one of um, uh, the psychiatrists um, there, a young, a young um, uh, psychiatrist, told me that during his stint of several years in a village in Ethiopia, not only did he have to take care of the, the village and the community, surrounding communities, but he had to take care of the animals because they, um, they, uh, the community would bring him animals. So he was also functioning as a veterinarian, very little sleep. Um, and um, so these, these, these doctors with not a lot of support or ancillary um, uh, staffing, they do amazing work. So what can we do to help? I think, um, you know, um, one thing we can do is be mindful of the brain drain and um, do things, everything we can to help uh, um, uh, maintain the clinical populations in the country of origin. So this involves um, um, enhancing uh, um, twinning where, where academic centers in the West um, with resources help academic centers in sub-Saharan Afri Africa to um, begin training programs and to maintain their training programs and to, to make life for these, these young clinicians um, and the quality of their lives improved because they, they wanna stay in their home countries. I mean, it, it, they have such a desire to be, to be uh, caregivers in their home countries, but for family reasons and elsewhere, they, they become tempted by, by Western countries. So we have to do that. And Ethiopia, by the way, is a great success story in that regard. You know that, Christina, from having worked in Ethiopia. Um, um, but this can be done in other parts of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa as well. And then there's task sharing. Um, we have to do a better job of, of doing the evidence-based research to prove that, that um, we can expand responsibilities for um, primary care uh, um, roles um, um, to non-specialists uh, in, in these areas, to take some of the pressure off um, primary care physicians and specialist physicians and, and um, um, high-level nurses even. Um, so that's another thing we can do. Um, and I also think the, the community of, of clinicians, we need to be more um, inclusive to bring them into uh, our communities in the West where we get support and solace from sharing stories, and um, uh, which is a time-honored way to deal with um, stress and chronic stress and toxic stress is to share stories. Um, and that's been one of the joys of working in global medicine and global psychiatry, is to get to know these wonderful clinicians. And I think we also have to expand access to these technologies that I spent time talking about today in terms of stress uh, management, meditation. Um, many of the meditative practices come from other societies and, um, um, uh, and also of cognitive behavioral therapy, your specialty is important in, in positive psychology and all of these things that we can now improve access through telehealth and through smartphone apps and, and so on. We have to do a much better job of that as well and to promulgate that for, for patients in Sub-Saharan Africa, for families and for clinicians. All right, thank you. So before we move on to the next question, I'm just going to request that you stop um, sharing your slides just so that the attendees oh. can see see your full face. Yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> All right, so moving on to um, one of the audience questions. So we have a question. Um, so when saying normal and healthy brain, 
where does the BIPOC brain, so those already experiencing mm -hmm. racial and um, racial trauma come in? And do we need to ask different questions for these brains already going through trauma? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for that question. And I think this is a time we all have to, to I mean, COVID-19 has unveiled once again um, um, this kind of um, injustice in, 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 in community health. And um, uh, this has been written about for a long time. Um, 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 I, may, I may get his, his name wrong, but uh, uh, Tudor Hart, a UK um, academic, a physician wrote about the inverse care law um, back in the 70s in a, in a famous article. And people still refer to the inverse care law. And what he meant was that, um, you know, in terms of access to care, um, those communities that for a variety of reasons need care the most um, get it the least. Um, and this is certainly true. Uh, in, in physical health care, but also in mental health care. And, and so that's part of the injustice, that's part of the structural problem that we face in our country. Um, um, and it's, you know, it's also food insecurity, shelter insecurity, um, um, uh, the, the racial injustice we we're experiencing in our country, um, uh, the fear factor, uh, so much has been written about about um, uh, black parents and their worry about their, their children in our society in, in relation to interactions with the police and so on. That's playing itself out in, that's why I spent time talking about how the brain has evolved its structures and what the, the purpose of those structures are. It's to keep us safe, to help us understand um, our environments so that we can make the best decisions possible. And if you're growing up in a community as a minority, and again, it's, it, when you think about the BIPOC population, it's black, but it's also in the indigenous populations. Think about the Navajo Nation and the, the scourge of COVID-19 in the Navajo Nation. Or think about um, um, Hispanic population. I skipped over some of the terrible data from New York City at the peak of the scourge with the death rates, um, um, you know, two and three times uh, in Black and Hispanics in New York. But the same is true in Navajo Nation. Uh, so, so when you're a minority, your brain is looking for anomalies. Um, the great um, neurologist from UCLA, Ramachandran, taught us that the right hemisphere is basically an anomaly detector, and it's going 24/7. It, the right amygdala is going 24/7, looking for anomalies because we have to analyze an anomaly to say, is that a danger or not? Is that a threat? Do I have to get my stress response system in gear because that's that's out of place or that's that's dangerous? That plays itself out, and you move from normal stress tolerable stress to the backside of that bell-shaped curve and you're in chronic stress land and if you spend too much time in chronic stress land you can bet dollars to donuts you're going to wind up with metabolic syndrome so you're going to wind up with truncal obesity you're going to wind up with hypertension you're going to wind up with 66 percent more diabetes you're going to wind up with um, uh, um, hyperlipidemia and, and um, uh, cardiac events. So it shouldn't surprise us that we're going to see that in Blacks and Indigenous people and, and, and Hispanics. And so that's really why this, this um, uh, you know, uh, seemingly disconnected group of, of, of disorders creates uh, high risk for COVID-19. It's not because there's something magical about diabetes or hypertension. No, there's something magical about the chronic toxic stress that makes people more susceptible, more vulnerable in terms of that 
ratio of resilience to stress, that stress numerator, resilience denominator, makes people more vulnerable to stress-related non-communicable diseases that start with metabolic syndrome. And now we know, and this is what we're hypothesizing based on the work of, of the UCLA team and some work that we did at Benson Henry on showing that when you learn how to do meditation, you can actually change the gene expression of your, your um, immune system. So you can dampen that, that antibacterial NF-kappa B transcription factor, pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokine storm versus version of, of immune response. And perhaps even you can balance your immune response. So there's also some antiviral um, because that challenge, when you're chronically stressed, we all know that you're more susceptible to viruses. And that's true of coronaviruses. Sheldon Cohen showed that in classic articles um, in New England Journal and elsewhere. So this all fits together to us in terms of being brain doctors, this makes perfect sense. And COVID-19, it, it, one thing it has done for us is remind us of how po powerful this whole story of stress and toxic stress, chronic stress, and resilience are for the whole um, 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 uh, process of clinical medicine and public health. That's why it's a great, um, I really appreciate talking to the Harvard School of Public Health audience because there's nowhere else where you see this intimacy between the missions of clinical medicine and the missions of public health. So we have um, some questions that have come in that are surrounded, um, really kind of focused on how to really like kind of low mood, having, you know, symptoms of anxiety, trying to prevent burnout in general. So one question that has come up is really, how is burnout different from anxiety and depression? And can you have one and not the other? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for that. Well, you know, the, it, like a lot of things in, in um, uh, brain conditions, they're a continuum. And, and when we think about depressed mood, the question is, is it gonna crystallize into something we recognize as melancholia or um, classic major depression? where you find yourself depressed every day, most of the day. And as part of that mood state, there are, there's a constellation of psychological and somatic symptoms that we recognize as a distinguishable um, neuropsychiatric condition. Um, but it's not monolithic. So, you know, I'm a, um, a kind of brain doctor who works with medical and surgical patients. And I see that constellation of symptoms in patients who have severe medical illness or post-surgical states and so on. And is that the same as the person who um, has a de novo major depressive disorder in their 20s or 30s? Um, there probably are some differences, but the truth of the matter, when you understand the brain in terms of it, 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 not only in terms of its synaptic functioning, but now also in terms of it, 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 what we call neurogenic neuroinflammation and how stress affects that, and also the connectome and the relationship of the neural networks to one another and kind of dimensions of psychiatric symptoms, including depression, um, you, you kind of understand that this is a, a, a multivariegated problem. Depression's a multivariegated problem. Um, and um, so in terms of answering the question about burnout, before I go off on way off on a tangent, um, because it's such an interesting question, when in terms of burnout, um, this I would start by modeling it as a problem 
of a person whose whose resilience to stress ratio has been okay and then they find themselves in a context in a setting in a job setting where they're spending much more time outside of of the left side of that bell curve in normal and tolerable stress uh, less time in the left side and much more time in the toxic stress side where their 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 energy balance you know as part of the smart program we use an energy battery metaphor where we have the 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 participants in the stress management resilience training program um, itemize the things that take energy away from them and the things that put energy back in and it's a wonderful exercise because people come back and they they're they just feel oh wow i never kind of thought about that and spending more time on those those items those behaviors those experiences that put energy in is going to help your resilience to stress ratio. Um, so, but think about the think about our frontline clinicians, for example. I mean, um, and you know, my children are kind of front uh, frontline uh, doctors, and basically, they during the surges, this was really difficult because they had other responsibilities too, and because of of this culture of endurance, um, they they feel like they're going to take it on themselves, et cetera, et cetera, and and that means that they're it, the things that normally are putting energy in, they're that's shrinking, and they're they're losing a lot of their energy. That means that their allostatic loading is going up. Because remember, allostatic load is all about your brain taking responsibility for maintaining your physiologies within the standard deviation of the norm. That takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of ATP. My brain is like, on a good day, is three pounds, okay? Uh, um, 204 pounds. And the brain is using up 25 to 30 percent of my energy and a lot of that energy is being used up to maintain my physiology uh, within a normative range and if i'm a frontline clinician that becomes harder and harder and harder to do and um, we end the day feeling totally exhausted and in, and if we then start to lose interest in things if the things we used to enjoy become less available to us, if it starts to invade our sleep, if we start to lose our appetite, then we start to look like the person who um, um, perhaps for other reasons, because of, remember I showed that triangle slide about the three hits, for other reasons they might have genetic vulnerabilities that led them to have a de novo major depressive disorder with symptoms like that, or because of lack of early nurturance and adverse childhood experiences. Um, so you see how you can start to understand the many different pathways to that final common pathway that looks like melancholia and major depressive disorder. So the answer is yes, burnout will oftentimes lead to anxious and depressed mood. Um, the, the, the question is, with um, um, tinkering around the edges in terms of lifestyle and in terms of what we were talking about today, is it malleable? Is it, is it um, um, can you mitigate against that anxiety and depressed mood? And can it change um, quickly with, with um, um, psychoeducation, if you will. And instead of, well, no, this is locked in, it's crystallized. This is going to need somatic therapies mm -hmm. in order to get them over the top. And for one person who's a frontline clinician who has genetic 
vulnerability, who has lack of early nurturance, it might be that spending time in that chronic stress world is actually going to drive them into a clinical state. Whereas another person who doesn't have those risk factors, he may look depressed and anxious until you do the kind of stress management resilience training or they do something to change, the, to get more into uh, that resilience to stress ratio balance. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Yeah. So unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but I just wanted to thank you so much for coming and giving the presentation. You always have such, such great information. I always learn something new every time I hear you speak. Um, but I do have a few closing remarks just for um, the forum. So today's forum um, is actually going to be the last COVID-19 mental health seminar that we're going to have um, for the summer. So we'll be taking a break in August and we'll actually be returning in September with a bi-monthly population mental health seminar series. Um, our forums are going to continue to be virtual, public facing and widely um, shared. And so if you haven't already done so, please join our listserv so that we're going to, we'll be sure to be able to inform you of any of these upcoming forums once we start them again in September. And all materials of our COVID-19 mental health forums are going to continue to be available on our, our, on our website. And so we hope that you'll continue to use them and share them as, um, as it's helpful and um, really continue to find them useful. And that's it for, for our forums for this summer. Right. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Greg, for being here to, to give us, to thank lead our conversation for today. Thank you and thank, thank you everyone. You.